Hey guys, Frosty Knives here, back with episode 5 of Frosty's EU Reviews in chronological order. And that brings us to Michael Reeves' action-adventure novel and the last Darth Maul-centric book that we're going to read before The Phantom Menace. And that is Darth Maul Shadow Hunter. Uh, now, up until this point, for all of this time, when Darth Sidious has been dealing with the Trade Federation, he's been dealing with four specific people. Uh, he's been dealing with uh, Newt Gunray, uh, Rune Hako, uh, Daltine Dauphine, Dauf Dauphine, and Half Monchar. Those have been his contacts uh, as he's been manipulating the Trade Federation. So, Sidious calls up, uh, calls up his Nemoidian contacts to talk about the very eminent trade embargo that's about to happen uh, on Naboo. And he notices that one of them is gone. Half Manchar is, is not there. And the Nemoidians know that he's not there and they don't know where he is. It makes them very nervous because they think that he is up to nefarious means. And he is. Uh, so... Sidious calls them and he does a quick head count. He's like, uh, didn't there used to be, uh, didn't there used to be four of you? Where's your, where's your, where's your compatriot? Where's your fourth member? There's only three of you. Where's the fourth one? And, uh, Gunnery doesn't know. And he chokes. He's not a good liar and he's nervous around Sidious. So he chokes and he tells him, ah, he's, he ate some bad food. Ah, he's ill. He doesn't feel, feel good. He's ill trots out the oldest book, the oldest argument in the book, right? He doesn't feel well, so he's resting. He's ill. And Sidious says, okay. Okay. And they think that they've pulled the wool over his eyes, which which they haven't. So uh, they go about their business, and they talk about the trade embargo, and then after that conversation, Sidious is, uh, is sitting there, th and he thinks, I think that he's going to betray me. And that's exactly what Monchar has decided to do. He has decided to take all the information that he knows about the trade embargo and the Sith and all the manipulation that's gone on, and he's going to try to make himself a quick buck. So he took all that information, put it on a holocron, and he left. He went to Coruscant. He's trying to. He's going to turn turn evidence and make a, a boat ton of money, and he's going to try to get out, get out of the deal, right? And Sidious is like, oh, he's going to betray us. So he calls in Darth Maul and he says, I want you to go find Manchar and I want you to kill him and I want you to get his information and anybody that he's spoken to, anybody at all that he's talked to or that he has potentially has this information, I want you to kill them too because we're not ready yet for the galaxy to know what we're doing. So we have to make sure that we're still hush hush. So he sends Maul on a murder spree. Of course, Maul is like, yeah, I got you. I got you. We're good. And off he goes. That's the main gist of the story. There are two other groups of characters uh, that the book introduces us to. Uh, the first group, uh, the first cast of characters is Lauren Pavan, who is an information broker living uh, down level in Coruscant. Uh, he, he buys and sells information to the highest bidder. And he has a protocol droid uh, I-5, and his protocol droid is not really his protocol droid in the sense that he, he doesn't own them. They're business partners, and they're information brokers, and they're down on their luck, and they're down in Coruscant, and they're in a bar, and they find out, they hear that there's a Nemoidian who wants to sell some information. wonder who that could be. And so they figure, well, we could get this information. I could sell it to Yant the Hut, who's one of my contacts. I can make some, we can make some money, we can get the hell off Coruscant, we can go to the Outer Rim, we can make a new life for ourselves. So that's how Lauren and I-5 get sort of dragged into this. The other cast of characters that we meet is a Jedi Padawan named Darsha Asant, and her Jedi Master, Twi'lek Jedi Master named Master Anun Bandara. And so the Jedi Council calls Darsha in, and they say, tell her, we have one last test for you. This is your final test. If you pass this test, you will become a Jedi Knight, full-fledged Jedi Knight. This is your Padawan test. And so she says, okay, this is the last bit that she has to do. 
So they tell her that down in, on Coruscant in a rough area of town called the Crimson Corridor, there is a Fondorian who wants to uh, leave Black Sun. He basically wants to turn state's evidence on Black Sun, the criminal organization, and he wants to, and the Jedi want this information that he has. And they feel that if they can bring him back and get the information, put him in like a protection program and keep him safe, that they could use this information to finally take down Black Sun. So they send her down there alone to do this. This is her final mission. And it goes sideways almost immediately. Um, she gets down there and she makes contact with the Fondorian. And then she gets ambushed by a gang and she tries to escape. They blow up her sky car. She can't go that way. So she tries to escape with the Fondorian. And in the process of, of running from this gang and making their escape, the Fondorian gets killed. So in her, in her, <laughs> in her last mission, in her final exam, if you will, she gets her informant killed. And now she's like, well, this is just great. I'm never going to be a Jedi now. I just, I just failed miserably on my mission. And so uh, eventually Darsha meets up with Lorne. Their paths will cross. Um, and that brings both of them on the scent of Darth Maul because they're all people that are sort of involved with this half Monchar. And so that's basically the rest of the book, is Maul finding Manchar, uh, which he does, and, and, and then finding everybody else uh, that Manchar may have given his information to and hunting them. And so it's, a, it's an action-adventure chase story. And it was quite, quite good. I quite, quite enjoyed it. It was uh, action and adventure from end to end. There was very little downtime. Uh, the book hit the ground running, and it kept going. Um, you know, the nature of the book is that it's a chase, so the pacing reflected that. So you were constantly being pushed forward in the plot, which I, I highly enjoyed. Um, just like Darth Maul was pushing uh, uh, Lorne and Darsha and I-5 to run, to get away from him, to try to escape, the author was pushing the plot forward, uh, so the pace was appropriate for the for the type of story uh, that it was. So let's talk about some of the things that I liked and any of the things that I may not have liked so much. One of the things that I really liked about this book, characterization was, was well done. I really liked the uh, relationship between Lorne and I-5. Thought it was wonderful. Uh, it was well fleshed out. They both were very unique. They both had very unique backstories. I like the fact that that Lauren never considered I-5 a droid, a, 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 his, that he owned a droid. Like most people who own a droid or who own a protocol droid or an astromech droid, they, they sort of considered them property. Lauren didn't. He considered them business partners. They were equals. And that was unusual. Uh, many people made reference to that in the book. Uh, they would say things like, well, you let your droid talk to you that way, or you let your droid do that. And, and Lauren would always correct them and say, it's not my droid. I don't own them. We're business partners. Um, to the, to the, and, and I, and I like that. that. That shows a lot about Lauren's character, that he doesn't consider a mechanical, right, a droid property, that he considers his droid, uh, their business partners, their equals. And I like that. I-5 had very dry, very witty humor, uh, which was fun to read. They had really good banter back and forth. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, Lorne uh, considered them equal so much that he had upgraded I-5's uh, programming to the point where he was almost sentient. He, he had given him as much program as he could give him to make him independent, autonomous, almost sentient droid. And I like that. I like the relationship that they had, like the, the, the banter that was there. I like the I-5 was was the one who primarily gave you the backstory of Lorne through dialogue, which I thought was a good idea. You don't get bogged down with, you know, just big chunks of information paragraphs. You just learn about uh, Lorne and I-5 through dialogue. It's a very nice way of doing things. 
I really like the character of Darsha Asant as the Jedi. Um, boy, things went terrible for her. It was just, it was just, it was just sideways after sideways after sideways. Um, and, 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 and that was, that was kind of rough to read. You, you sort of feel a little bit bad for her because everything she tried to do just went kablooey. But she was a really good character. You got to see a little bit more of different Jedis, which I like. In these books, you get to see different Jedis and different philosophies, different takes. And I really like the character of, of Darsha. And I really wish that we got to see more of Darsha and more of Lorne. Lorne. Uh, but we'll get that to that in a minute. So that was done really well. Though that was a, a big highlight was was all of the characterizations of of uh, of the new characters and 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 the, some of the old characters we get were fairly consistent. Uh, Darth Maul was consistent. He's been consistent through all of the books. Single minded pursuer, so his characterization was spot on. And we get to see some of Obi Wan and his characterization was was spot on to what we know of Dar of Obi-Wan in the movies and then in following. So it was all done with really well. I like that we got to see Coruscant. This whole book took place on Coruscant over, I think, a two-day period. And we got to see Coruscant. We got to see more of that. And that's good because Coruscant is going to become very important. Coruscant is an, ex is an extremely important planet in everything going forward. And there's more to Coruscant than meets the eye. When we think of Coruscant, we think of what we saw in the movies. But there's more to it than that. And I'm glad that we get to start seeing the dark underbelly that is Coruscant. Um, and this is maybe a good time to talk a little, just a little bit about Coruscant. Um, because it is important. It is the galactic capital, if you will. Um, and as you may or may not know, Coruscant is essentially a giant planet city. There is cities that covers the entire surface of Coruscant. It's all industrialized. It's all city. It's all built up. There are no more natural resources. All of Coruscant's oceans and rivers and water sources have been, um, have been drained or gone. Every square millimeter of Coruscant's surface that can be built up has been built up. It is the most industrialized planet in the Republic. Um, and they even make mention that it is so heavily industrialized. That there's so much carbon emission being poured into Coruscant's atmosphere that if they didn't have high end like air scrubbers and all the technology that they did have, that Coruscant would have essentially been a lifeless rock hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It would have, it would have killed itself. Yeah, so it relies on the technology to um, to survive, to even be a planet, um, and there's no natural resources. Everything has to come into everything has to come into Coruscant, and there's two levels of Coruscant. What you see on the movies, that's the upper level of Coruscant. That's the surface city. That's above the fog. So there's the there's the upper city, and that's where the uh, Jedi Temple is. That's where the uh, Senate is. That's where all the wealthy live, uh, up on the upper city level of Coruscant. But below that, because Coruscant has been built over the years from the ground up, there's levels of the city. Below the fog layer and below the upper city is the lower levels, the lower city of Cor Coruscant. And that is where the poor people live, the regular Joes, the criminals, the drug cartels, the bounty hunters, all the seedy uh, aspects of Coruscant is down below. So Coruscant literally has an upper class and a lower class. And that's the two levels of Coruscant. And the lower level of Coruscant, the further down you get, closer to the surface of the planet, um, the more dark it gets. The down, down in the lower levels is almost perpetually night. It's almost, almost perpetually twilight because the light from Coruscant's sun can't reach down there. It's so industrialized and built up. So they, they live in the dark. They live by the lights of neons and whatever lighting that they've made up. It's very dark. It's very gritty. It's very uh, claustrophobic. And, and that's where all of, um, all of the, the, the seedy elements of Coruscant are. And of course, the, the, the wealthy up top never go down below because they don't want to deal with it. 
and the the people from below don't have any money. They 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 can't and they can't get out of that, so they never go to the top. And of course, the lower city hates the upper city, and the upper city pretends that the lower city doesn't exist. So that's Coruscant, and this book takes place on Coruscant, mostly in the lower levels. And we will see a lot of that division, a lot of that lower levels. We'll see a lot more of Coruscant um, and the, the two parts of it as we go further down in the series. And it eventually will become very important. Coruscant is almost like its own it's, its own character, right? The, the Coruscant is a character uh, because there's so much to it. And I'm glad that we got to see a lot of that. We're, we're beginning to see the other sides of the planet. Uh, so that was that was well done. A um, couple of things I I didn't like not so much, uh, and, and they're real nitpicks. And one of them isn't even isn't even a nitpick because I understand it. Um, one of the problems with this with books like this that that you know that they're they're sort of sh not shoehorned, but they're working within a continuity, and you know that they got to do certain things within that continuity, and you know that because of that continuity. The new characters in this book, in the book, are most likely not going to survive. You know that going in because they're not in anything following. And so you already know that. Um, and that this book is no no different. And, th and that sort of made me sad that I knew going in that Lorne and Darsha were most likely, and I-5 were most likely not going to survive. Uh, just because of the way it bookends sort of the, you know, it's right up there against Phantom Menace and the way it sort of bookends it. And they got to work within established lore. And that is indeed the case. Uh, Lorne and Darsha does not make it, do not make it through this movie, through this book. Um, I-5 is the only one who does, and that's only because he gets his memory wiped. So uh, we don't get to see any more. I was kind of rooting for Darsha to survive, even though I knew she wouldn't. So we don't get to see any more of, this char of these characters of Darsha, of Lorne. Although... Uh, we do find out that Lorne does have a son named Jax, who is uh, a Jedi in the Jedi Temple. Um, so maybe, and I think I think Jax is going to feature in some other books down the line. So we may not get to see more of Lorne, but we will get to see some of Jax as we get further down down the line. So that's not really a, a, a criticism. It's, it is what it is because of the way this sits in the chronology. Uh, it's just kind of, it's, it's a bummer. That I don't know, we're not going to get to see any more of of Lorne and Darsha. They they made a hell of a team, and it was, they were great characters, and they were wonderful to read, and I really liked them a lot. Um, so that's kudos to Michael Reeves for making some really good characters. Um, the other nitpick that that I have was um, they tried to not force. I don't want to say they tried to force a relationship between Darsha and Lorne, but they tried to work a relationship between the two of them, a personal relationship, sort of a, like a, a romantic relationship, which is fine. I can see I can see that coming from Lorne, uh, sort of, you know, falling for someone. But it didn't ring true for Darsha uh, because she's a Jedi and the Jedi aren't allowed attachments. Uh, as a matter of fact, they make a big, that's a big part of Lorne's backstory was that he worked for the Jedi, and the Jedi found out that his son was Force-sensitive, so they asked him if he could be trained in the temple, and Lauren said, yes, you can train Jax. So they took him to train him as a Jedi, and then they fired him. Then they fired him, and they said, well, he can't have any attachments, and that includes attachments to you, because the Jedi aren't allowed attachments, so you gotta go. And so they kicked Lauren out, and that's why Lauren hated the Jedi in the beginning of the book. Um, because they can't have attachments. So Lorne falling for Darsha, I can understand, because he's uh, he's a, just a regular person. But Darsha reciprocating that seemed a little odd to me. She knows that she's not allowed, that Jedi aren't allowed to have attachments. She's been li lived in the temple her whole life since she was two. This has been drilled into her head. This has been knocked into her head. She knows that she's not allowed, Jedi aren't allowed to have attachments. But she, she, she still had that. And she didn't even say things like, I know this is forbidden, but I still feel this way, which would have been the easy out. That would have been the easy out to write in that she knows it's it's forbidden, but she still has these feelings that she has to wrestle with. 
They didn't address that. So to me, that's a slight bit of continuity error. They didn't sort of ring true to the Jedi lore. But again, that's just a nitpick. Um, those are really the only things that I didn't quite like, or that I didn't, that not that I didn't like them, but were just nitpicks of the book. Because I still think the book was great. And the book uh, is a great way to, it, it bookends so nicely with The Phantom Menace because it ends literally with Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon getting ready and Obi-Wan saying, where are we going, Master? And he says, Qui-Gon says, oh, the Trade Federation has just started an embargo and we got to go be ambassadors. So let's go. We're hitting the road. And that bleeds right into Phantom Menace very, very nicely. So overall, this was a great book. Uh, I gave it a four out of five. Wasn't quite a five. It was close, but not quite a five. But it was a solid four. And it's a good book. It's a good read. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reading more of Michael Reeves' books in the Star Wars universe because I really like this one and the way he wrote characters and the way he wrote action and the, the pacing that he did was really well done. So guys, that is my review of Darth Maul, Shadow Hunters, the last book, the last foundation laying, the last breadcrumb and, and loose end tying uh, that, that we've done before we get to uh, Phantom Menace. So the next book that we're going to read, and I'll just give you a, a small brief update on this. The next Star Wars book that we are going to read is going to be our first novelization. That will be uh, The Phantom Menace. We're there. We're at the first movie novelization. And that's our next Star Wars book that we're going to read. Uh, but that's not the next book that I'm going to read because I've decided that after every five Star Wars books that I read, I need a palate cleanser. I'm also waiting for The Phantom Menace to come in the mail because I ordered it. <laughs> so I got a bit of a break. But I think it's a good idea that after every fifth book, I read something different, sort of a palate cleanser, just to break up the monotony because I don't want to get bored. And I'm not going to get bored because this is super fun for me. Um, but I just want to I just want to have a little bit of palate cleansers. So after every fifth Star Wars books book, you're going to get a King review because there are some King some small King books that I haven't reviewed, read and reviewed yet that I'm going to use as palate cleansers. Uh, specifically, those being uh, Gwendy's Magic Feather, uh, Gwendy's Final Task, Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, Carrie, which I'm surprised I never read and reviewed, and Eyes of the Dragon. I'm going to use those as palate cleansers. So every sixth book review is going to be a King review. So the next book that I'm actually going to read and review will be Gwendy's Magic Feather. And then after that, we're right back into the Star Wars universe with The Phantom Menace. So guys, I hope you liked, uh, enjoyed the review, and I hope you uh, enjoyed the ride. We're, we're already, we're, we're making some good progress, and, and I'm having fun doing it because I love being in this universe, and I love reading these books, and um, and these books are wonderful reads uh, for me. So I'm having, I'm, having, I'm having fun. I'm having a hell of a time doing this. So I hope you enjoyed this review. Give it a like, give it a thumbs up, give it a share, spread it around, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your people, all of your people who wanted to be there but couldn't be there because they just got, they just ate some bad, some bad fish and they're feeling a little bit ill. And until next time, I will see you in the next review.